because race is such a sensitive issue, people are so scared. They're walking on pins and needles, you know, walking on eggshells just to figure out how to navigate it. But I think the first part of it is just being okay to making a mistake. Mm -hmm. And it is, um, you know, if you do make a mistake, own up to it, apologize, don't gaslight, don't say no, don't be on the defensive. That is part of the unlearning process, especially if you are a person of privilege. Welcome to the Productpreneur Podcast. I'm your host, Nicole Delarzac, product development and marketing coach and mom of three. Learn from and get inspired by women entrepreneurs killing it in the product space. Each episode, we will share the latest trends, proven strategies, and inside secrets of the product world, all designed to give you greater confidence to create your own success through a product venture. Let's do this. In order to dismantle white supremacy, you must understand how white privilege is a key aspect of your life, how you benefit, whether knowingly or unknowingly, from your whiteness, what that means for people who do not receive the same benefits, and how you can dismantle it. You cannot dismantle what you cannot see. You cannot challenge what you do not understand. Layla F. Saad, Me and White Supremacy. This is a different podcast episode. It may cause you discomfort, cause you to question your beliefs or actions, or your marketing, but that is how we can truly learn and make real change. We are speaking about this topic at the time when the Black Lives Matter movement is at the forefront of media around the world, surfaced by the recent horrific events that occurred against Black people by police. These events have brought to life the inequality that colored people have faced for far too long. The movement has inspired me to take a deeper look into my own white privilege and see how I can personally take action in helping dismantle systemic racism. I always thought of myself as inclusive, but I quickly realized I could do better in this area. It started with educating myself, as I am certainly not an expert in this area, and I sought out books as well as trusted sources. One of the key people I turned to about this issue was Jennifer Singh, who has been very active in the conversation around inclusive marketing. Jennifer is a thought leader in this area, having done several interviews, including a media interview with Global News that aired across the country and three podcast interviews on this topic, and has also created a webinar about this subject. Jennifer is a former TV reporter turned PR strategist and media coach. She launched She's Newsworthy Media to help female entrepreneurs and business owners increase media attention for their brands by pitching their expertise to the media. So far, she has helped over 35 women land media spots on all of the most popular TV shows, like The Social, Breakfast Television, just to name a few. During this episode, we talk about inclusive marketing, why it is important for all businesses, how making mistakes in this area is part of learning, how inclusivity must be ingrained in your long-term strategy, why cultural appropriation may not be appropriate, what are some best practices and things to avoid as a brand, and so much more. I'm thrilled to welcome Jennifer Singh to the podcast. I personally learned so much from this interview, and I know you will too. Jennifer, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you here. Uh, You've been an inspiration to me in this space on inclusive marketing you've been my go-to person when it comes to this topic. So I really thank you for coming to the show and for sharing your wisdom with our listeners. And I know they'll get so much out of it. So thank you. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. Excited for this conversation. Yeah, me too. So let's get started. Can you tell us about your background and how you got into PR? Because you have a really interesting story. And uh, I love the, the mission that you have as a company. So I'd love for you to share that. Yeah, so I started off as a journalist, a reporter. I've worked in the industry for about 15 years. I was a journalist since I was probably about 18 or 19, writing in the Toronto Star. I actually just found one of my old articles, which is funny, and it was talking about racism in high school. So that thread Mm. of that storytelling has always been there. I worked in front of the camera, behind the camera, and one of the things that I was noticing Time after time, doesn't matter if I was reporting in Ontario, which is fairly diverse, or on the East Coast, that every time I would have to go get an, a guest expert. Um, usually, you go in in the morning and they say, Go out and do this interview. You have to find an expert. Most of the times, it was 
and older white males. So that representation of the female voice was not being amplified in the media. So when I started my company, She's Newsworthy Media, that was my mission. I had that intention set inside of me because of my experience. I would never see myself represented um, in color or in gender in a majority of the media interviews, even the ones that I was doing. Right. So that was kind of the basis of how She's Newsworthy Media started. Wow. I love that. Yeah. When you think about it, like women have not been equally represented in the media or in business. When you think about diversity, that takes it to a whole new level. So um, I love that. And I, I remember seeing a social post of yours. I think it was before the Black Lives Matter movement. And you talked about the lack of diversity in female speakers. And uh, I just thought about that. That was so interesting because it's as someone um, with white privilege, I hadn't noticed that. And and it's shame on me. Like I just never noticed it. And so I'd love for you to tell people about that experience. Was that what led you to start talking about this subject? So truthfully, I've been talking about being inclusive my entire life. It's a lived experience, right? Because I've never really been represented. Here's the thing though, I wasn't allowed to talk about it. I wasn't allowed or felt safe or felt comfortable talking about it because there could be financial repercussions to my business. There could have been financial uh, reproductions, repercussions inside corporations that I worked at before. Nobody's, I'm not going to stand up and say, I'm not being represented in the media. I could lose my job, right? That could, that's a legitimate um, fear of a lot of people. So it's so funny when this whole Black Lives Matters movement came about, being able to talk about inclusivity just became more acceptable. And yes, I have definitely been harping on the lack of inclusivity when it comes to events and conferences. I transitioned from the corporate media world to being an entrepreneur. And of course, I want to up-level my skills. I want to um, attend conferences where I can learn and be better. Everybody on the stage does not look like me. Also, My goal is to continue to build myself as a speaker on those stages. But if I don't see myself, how is that something that is attainable? And it's really interesting because that point, that post that you're talking about, when I put it out, I'm telling you, I legitimately was very nervous in hitting posts because some of the stuff that was in that post was very controversial at the time, right? Like it was stuff that I wasn't able to say out loud. What resulted from that right before the Black Lives Matters movement blew up on social media was I got gaslit. I got gaslit and I ended up, I ended a couple business relationships because of some of the comments in that post. Oh, wow. So, okay. So actually, can we take a pause? Yes. Can you explain what gaslighting is? Because actually I didn't know what it was before this whole, when I started so, to research. It's almost like if we want to really think about gaslighting in like not simpler terms, but terms that we can wrap our head around. It's like when you have an abuser and the abusee and the abuser, the the abusee is complaining and the abuser says, no, 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 it's you. It's not me. Right. So they're putting the blame on the person who's feeling victimized. So very similar. What happened was in that post, I said that. I was not being represented. I was not seeing, you know, people like myself at at events. I was not getting uh, compensated at events where I was included as much as my white counterparts. And the response was that, well, just go out and, and, um, and create your own event. And it was such a slap in the face. And I said, so there's not enough women in the boardroom. So do we, do the women just all run out and build their own corporations? Is that the solution? So, um, so yeah, so, and then somebody else had popped into that conversation and was trying to say, no, no, they had the best intention. They're very connected to the black community. What does that have to do with anything? We know now from the discourse, you can be married to somebody who is black. Well, first of all, I'm not black, so I don't know what that had to, how that was an answer. It wasn't even an answer, but you can still be a racist and have, you know, family members who are black indigenous people of color. You can have, you know, a spouse that's, you know, of a different race and still be racist. Like, don't tell me that, um, you know, that's an acceptable response. Uh, You could tell how, like, upset it got me, but it was kind of like something I had to keep to myself and something that I wasn't allowed to talk about. So 
that's kind of, you know, what transpired with that post. And after that, after it became okay on social media to talk about this stuff, I try to have just been going full force and I'm not holding back. I'm done. I'm done holding back. Oh, I really that's am. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. I, the only way I can relate to what you're saying is when I think of, you know, the lack of female speakers and when I see all white men on stage and then I, I think, well, that's not me. I'm not represented there. I don't even want to be a part of that. So I can understand what you're saying. And it's, it was very brave when I saw that post, I thought, wow, she's very brave to be talking about it. And you're right. And now we, it's finally acceptable to, to talk about it. And I'm so glad you are. Cause I think so many people are learning from your experiences and your, your wisdom and, and probably your whole life learning on the topic, right? Mm -hmm. How have your personal frustrations helped you become an influencer in this area? And have you included that in your mission as part of your work? Well, it's funny, right? Because I feel like last month was a whirlwind. I literally went on this influencer marketing track and never got off. I, I, I'm shocked, honestly, to, 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 to be identified as an influencer. I honestly did not realize that I had become a thought leader in that space. I did not realize it. Everything that I've been talking about is again, is just stuff that I talk about with my personal friends, my close neck or where I feel safe. My husband will tell you, if you are sitting down to watch TV with me, I am annoying because I'm watching the commercials. I'm talking about the identity politics. I'm talking about how women are being portrayed, how people of different colors are being portrayed. It's just what I see all the time. I actually studied this in university. It's called semiotic analysis. So there's an actual technical term when you look at class, gender, race, and how they're portrayed in society and the different layers and interpretations that we get from Let's say, for example, um, one of the examples I used was from two of those really popular shows. Um, one was The Morning Show. It was a series. And the other one was called Bomb Squad, right? So it was all based on stuff happening in newsrooms. And the posters were of white women. They were like the heroes and like the heroes in the story. But the, the person in one of them that was actually the victim of the sexual harassment was black. Why wasn't she on the poster? Mm, right? right? So that's just stuff it really is if you start seeing it you cannot unsee it you really right. cannot unsee it yeah I, I think as I'm learning about it I'm increasing my own awareness and I now start to see things that I never saw before so I think that is probably the first step is education educating yourself about about the movement and about history and how people are portrayed in media and so you've been very active in your Facebook group and uh, you've even created a webinar about inclusive marketing. And I think that is so we needed because brands, I feel like they're scrambling right now. Like as soon as this whole movement started, they're all of a sudden scrambling to come out with a statement or some come out with what their stance is on this issue and prove, know that they are uh, inclusive. And on, in one hand, that's amazing. On the other hand, then they're criticized for, well, where have you been these past few years when you were never inclusive and now you're suddenly inclusive? So could you speak to this paradox of what do brands do in this situation and and how can they become more inclusive without um, without being criticized, I guess? And I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Everybody should be open to criticism. You're, you're never going to not be criticized for something take the inclusivity out of the formula and just think about being a business owner, right? So you're going to be criticized for everything. I was criticized for uh, being just exclusive to women. I was criticized. Did I, you know, cry and go under the covers and close my business? No, I'm, you know, um, you're going to, I just it's feel like people need to just get their heads wrapped around the fact that because race is such a sensitive issue, people are so scared. They're walking on pins and needles, you know, walking on eggshells just to figure out how to navigate it. But I think the first part of it is just being okay to making a mistake. Mm -hmm. And it is, um, you know, if you do make a mistake, own up to it, apologize, don't gaslight, don't right. say no, don't be on the defensive. That is part 
of the unlearning process, especially if you are a person of privilege. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just setting it up so that again, it's not going to be something that even if you are starting to um, include people of different backgrounds in either a podcast, events, uh, influencer marketing, whatever it may be, what does it look like three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now? Is that something that you've incorporated into your business? Uh, people can say whatever they want. They can criticize you along the path. But if you know and you're sticking to your core values and you know that this is, you have stuff, you don't have to reveal all your plans to people. But I do recommend um, being open about it and talking about it and being okay to make mistakes. I have never seen people that are white so scared of making a mistake. It, it's mm. pretty, it's, it's kind of funny and kind of mind blowing at the same time because the fear that, um, you guys are experiencing, you guys, I'm generalizing here, obviously, but if you have, um, if you are white, the fear that you have is of being looked upon differently or bad. Well, think about how black indigenous people of color feel their entire lives. Exactly. So the few instances or the moments that we feel discomfort, this is what other people have been experiencing their whole life. In and silence. So, in silence. Yes, in silence. And they can't even talk about it which is mind blowing. Right. And so who, you know, who are we to go around thinking, Oh, we feel uncomfortable all of a sudden. Of course we feel uncomfortable. Good. Finally, we feel uncomfortable. Part of the growth. Like you have to be yeah. uncomfortable in anything you do in life to grow. Right. Yes, for sure. And then also identifying that we are not being inclusive or have made a mistake or whatever it is being able to accept that and talk about it. I've, I've seen some influencers do this really well. And I think that it's really admirable when they talk about how they haven't been inclusive and, and really are taking steps to include that as part of their uh, strategy and mission and everything. So I think that's really important when you talked about being willing to be uncomfortable, to make mistakes, to not worry so much about being criticized and to do what is right and, and including inclusivity as part of our core values. And that's a long-term thing. It's not a short-term gain where we just, it's performative and we just have people of color in a few social posts or put a black square up or whatever it is. I think the other part of that though, when we, when we think about influencers, right? It's not just what is on our feed or the content we're pushing out. We also have to think about the partnerships that we create. So if you are being invited to speak on a stage, ask those questions. Who else is on that stage? Is everybody white? Is there inclusivity? Push your partners, right? You're not just supposed to be you know, in this little box with your business and the content you're pushing out, but I'm sure you're getting approached to do podcasts. You're getting approached to partner for influencer marketing. You're getting approached to do media interviews, maybe on a panel. Who else is being included? Take that responsibility as well to put other people accountable. That's the only way it's going to happen. You can't just function in this little bubble and say, well, I'm doing my part in my business. You got to start asking those bigger questions so that other people can um, start thinking about it. I had um, an instance where a coach of mine was approached by a course creator to create her to add her course to a bundle. And the person wrote back and was like, everybody's white. Is this, is this a pro is this like a bundle just for white women? That's what she literally wrote and it held the course creator accountable. And she wrote back and she was like, Oh my gosh, I've been so ignorant. So that's what I'm saying. It doesn't just have to happen in what you push out to your content, but as business owners, we get approached constantly to, for partnerships, for endorsement, for courses, for podcasts, for media interviews hold other people accountable too. That's, that's something you can do when nobody's watching. Right. That's so good. It's like being an advocate for, for uh, people of color, for diversity. It's not only people of color. Um, I was reading a quote by Google and um, they were talking about how diversity is not just people of color. It's people of different sexualities. It's people of different abilities. Mm -hmm. it's, it's everything. So we have to think about it in that lens as well. And could you speak about how, why is inclusive marketing important? At the end of the day, it impacts the bottom line. If we don't want to live up to the moral obligation that we have to be in a more inclusive society, by marketing your products and your services in a certain way that only includes a certain demographic, pretty much means that everybody else is not included. Now, when we think about 
being an entrepreneur, you want a niche, right? You want a niche so narrowly that you do attract your dream clients. But at the same time, like who are you, who are you excluding unfairly? And I'll give you a couple right. examples of, you know, for a speaker event, if I'm scrolling through and I see all everybody on the panel's white, I'm probably not going to buy a ticket. If I see an influencer is promoting a product uh, and I know that, you know, everything she does in her business and everything I see is not inclusive, I'm not going to purchase that product right so it has financial repercussions and I mean if you don't believe that you have a moral obligation well you know what it does impact the bottom line I kind of almost think of it you know when everybody all the big companies are now going green all of a sudden right mm -hmm, to hop on right. the bandwagon because they know that there's a marketing um, advantage there and that they can make more money but they also should have a moral obligation to do better for the earth that we live in. It's mm -hmm. the same thing. It right. doesn't have to be that complicated. It's the same thing when we think about it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I, and I do think about brands who have done it well, and I'm sure their bottom line has been helped because of it. Are there any brands that you can think of that do a really great job with inclusivity? I would pretty much refer to people in my inner circle. When I say inner circle, people, other entrepreneurs where I see that they're showing up and they're not scared to make mistakes. They're mm -hmm. admitting that they're working on, um, you know, working on, on being more inclusive. Uh, I know an entrepreneur who has always promoted inclusivity. You can see it in the people that she works with, what's on her social feed. Um, I enrolled in one of her programs and when I got inside, everybody was from around the world and they looked different. It was the first time that's ever happened. And this person is white. So there's, you know, she's doing a, fa a phenomenal job. And I also think of some of my previous clients who, if they are pitching to the media, they are making those small decisions behind the scenes, such as having um, the ability to amplify somebody's voice who is of color. So for example, if you're doing a media interview, sometimes you need to, a secondary character in your interview. Who, who, who are you gonna choose? Are you just gonna choose one of your close friends or are you, just gonna, are you gonna choose somebody who's gonna be able to have their voice heard because their voice is not normally heard? Right, yeah, yeah. And I remember I heard you speaking about a couple of your clients who chose to amplify the voices of people of color before this whole movement happened. So that was really cool. Yeah, yeah. that's because that's that's just the way their brain works. Mm. They literally, and it's so funny because I have, you know, I've had worked with many women and some of them will openly say while we're trying to pitch their story or craft it or find the angle that they acknowledge their privilege and they don't want to come off as an, as a, white privileged woman. They acknowledge that. Yeah. Wow. And I, you know, I'm not sitting there trying to strategize how do how do we not make you look like that? But you know what what's really important? It's the perspective. They're bringing a fresh perspective. Yeah, that's great. Beautiful. Yeah, one brand I can think of and I used to work for them. So, I know it's ingrained in their strategy is Coca-Cola. They're all around the world, even way back in the 70s. They came out with the campaign, I'd like to buy a world of Coke. And you see people from all around the world coming together and singing in harmony. And it was just so beautiful at the time and still is beautiful. It's iconic. So that's just one brand that I know that does ingrain it in their strategy and, and especially in their marketing as well. So what I would say about that is that it doesn't matter what the corporation is. And if they are outwardly showing inclusive marketing, my question is what's happening behind the scenes? What's happening inside closed doors? Are people of color getting paid the same as their white counterparts, right? So that marketing team, who's on that marketing team or who is the other individuals in that corporation? When you walk in that building, is there a mix of people or is it all the same? And I mentioned the wage because when we think of systemic racism, when we think about how deep it goes, you can have inclusive marketing on the surface. But okay. say, for example, you have two influencers and your influencers, um, there was actually, there was actually um, an agency that talked outwardly about this, about their Black, Indigenous, people of color who are influencers. They don't get picked up by the brands because everybody on those corporations are um, part of those brand teams are white. But what also happens is they don't get paid the same as their white counterparts. So mm -hmm. you can, um, you know, great for Coca-Cola, um, you know, that shows that they definitely are thinking outside of the box and they haven't been doing things the traditional way. But I mm -hmm. challenge every company that, you know, think a little deeper because that's 
we know that marketing is superficial. It doesn't represent everything that's happening behind the scenes. Right. And so how does a brand or company marketer ingrain that into their strategy? How do we make sure that it's deeply rooted in the strategy so that it's not just surface? Well, I think it's taking the time to invest in diversity and, and inclusion experts and having them come in and look at all parts of your business, whether it's the hiring, whether it's how you are um, you know, doing brand partnerships, whether you are marketing a product, it doesn't matter what it is. One of the pushbacks that I've actually heard when I've made this suggestion is that people can't afford to hire a diversity and inclusion expert, which is mind blowing to me. Um, I was told that, well, then business owners are going to be at a disadvantage because not everybody can afford to um, invest in a diversity and inclusion expert. And I said, oh, really? I'm like, can those people afford to buy conference tickets? Can those people afford to purchase Facebook ads? Can those pre-fill purchase to have their website up and running? I'm sure they can. So it's not that you can't afford it. It's that you don't have it as a priority. So, you know, making it a priority to look at who you were hiring on your teams that are going to make the decisions and going to catch things, right? There's so many times that we, we see, and I'm trying to think if I can think of one right now where did nobody realize that? Did nobody see that ad? Like that, that's me when I'm watching TV. I'm like, who approved that? <laughs> Who was in their marketing team that approved that, right? right? So having those people in that feel safe mentioning, creating that space where you feel safe to mention it and that your job's not going to be uh, jeopardy if you do bring up something that could be perceived in marketing as racist. Totally. Totally. Yeah. You mentioned hiring also who's on your team, having diversity experts, Something I've really heard a lot about, and I think I've said it myself, is I don't see color. And so what is wrong with saying I don't see color? By saying that you don't see color, it is diminishing the experiences of people of color. Let's say you're in a corporate environment and you are at a table and everybody there is white. And that one person who is a person of color or black or indigenous speaks up. Are you really in a room and you're the only person and you're not going to acknowledge that their experience is different and you really don't see color? Right. I say, this is my thing. I say, I don't notice my color until I'm, it's not in the room. That's exactly how I've been moving through life, right? So one day I was actually um, working for a broadcaster and I went into the studio and everybody, there was five other anchors doing their sports, doing their world news, doing everything, their weather, their traffic. And they were all white men. And I didn't like, then I was like, oh, so if you're going to walk into the room and you're white and you say, I don't see color. What do you mean you don't see color? Right. So right. that makes sense. You, yeah. So I think the argument recently, cause I have seen that, right? Like the problem with saying all lives matters is the same thing as saying, I don't see color where you're trying, you're, um, you kind of like actually function in a bubble where you think, no, 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 I'm good. I'm not racist. I don't acknowledge anything, but that's by saying that you don't acknowledge your privilege. I think that's, if we're thinking about the core of it, you're not acknowledging that you are privileged over the person who isn't. Mm, that's, that's profound. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I, I read about it and it was pointing out the same thing by saying you don't see color, you're not respecting or appreciating the cultures of other people and you're really diminishing them. And so I never thought about it that way. Another thing I've read recently is the idea of taking vernacular from the different communities around the world. So I think it's not just the black community, but indigenous, like words like tribe. Mm -hmm. And using that and it's become really cool lately. And I don't think people understood that, no, actually, this is not something that we want to do. Can you speak to this? 
Well, I think language is so important. It's how we communicate with each other um, on a personal level and of course on a professional level and how we push content out to our business, right? Mm -hmm. As marketers, we are always trying to engage our audiences and have that connection. And a lot of those um, words have started popping up, right? When we think of tribe, um, you know, that is really ingrained in indigenous culture and its appropriation in the sense that you're taking something from that culture and using it to profit and make money, right? So that's how people um, are thinking about it. Again, it may be hard to wrap your head around this if you're listening and try to really understand how that is problematic. I'm gonna you know, break it down to gender. How many times have you had somebody in your DMs who don't know that is like, hey boss babe, right? They're, you know, I actually saw, I actually saw, I was scrolling on Facebook today, I saw, a sponsored Facebook ad that was like, Hey boss, boss babe. And I was like, how on earth am I getting this? Like, why is this being targeted to me? Right. right? So why is it not like we, we don't think about how important culture is. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's one part of it. So when we think of uh, vernacular, a lot of the coaches in the States were being accused of taking, extracting language from black culture, cis, boo, queen, to connect with their mostly white audiences to kind of have that bond or that relationship. And that's kind of how they would, you know, address their community. The problem, which is what I've heard from people from the black community is that type of language. If somebody from the black community walked into an office or walked into, uh, walked on a stage and started speaking like that, they would get not praised. They wouldn't get praised for that. They would be viewed as, you know, not as superior or not as intelligent or something like that. But somebody's extracting these, these words and these terms of endearment and, you know, really specifically pushing it onto a white audience. And it makes people who are black uncomfortable. I'm obviously not black and can't speak for everybody, but that is some of the feedback that I've heard. No, it totally makes sense. And it it's when cultures use vernacular from cultures that have been marginalized. It's, yeah, it's just a lack of respect. And I've never seen it that way. I always thought, oh, okay, that's a positive thing. We're all one world. We're all kind of working together. But no, I can understand that point of view. So I think a lot of people are going to be revisiting the language they use and especially in advertising and what, um, what marketing does go out there. What are some ways that brands can ensure that they are inclusive and that they are um, be inclusive in the long run in their marketing. Again, it just goes back to investing in having either an expert come in or continuing to read and to learn and to mark all the points in your business where you know that there could potentially be gaps and make sure that you are checking off all of the boxes when it comes to, am I really thinking about how this can impact a larger audience. I have an example for you actually, which is really interesting. I'm sure you or a lot of people that are listening now have shared a post on your social media feed of a stack of books. Maybe it's the stack of your favorite books. If you have done this, right? I've done, I did this last year and it was a stack of mindset books, right? I was actually giving you, uh, you know, a mindset giveaway. How many of those authors are white and how many of those authors are black indigenous people of color? And I realized, because somebody had just posted on their Facebook or their social media the other day that there's an entire list. So that's what I'm saying. There's could be those little gaps where, okay, let's take a look at my social media marketing. What can I do? Create a strategy for that. What can I do if I'm creating an event? Create a strategy for that. You know, what other groups am I going to engage in? Who else can I um, reach out to? You have to constantly ask questions, right? And it's going to be uncomfortable. And that's why a lot of people don't want to do it. But it's also going to take extra work because somebody who's been booking their 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 podcast interviews with their inner circle, that's going to take them work to try to figure out how do I now find people who are inclusive? Right. How do I do that? Right? right. But again, I always take it back to anything in your business. If you are an entrepreneur, you are a superstar. That means you've figured out how to make, make money. You figured out funnels, you figured out your Facebook ads, you figure out connecting with um, people, you figure out networking. That is just an extension of something else. Totally. It's definitely, it's doable. And it's, uh, it's just something that we have to keep top of mind. I mean, any, anything that we produce or put out there, we need to always have that lens of inclusivity. Something that comes to mind is the stock photos. I think you mentioned there's not a lot of stock photos out there with diversity. 
So that's just one example. But anything that we do, and if we're developing a product, for example, there, I don't want to mention any names, but there, there's not a lot of products or they haven't been in particular that target people of color. And so even when we think about like, say if it's underwear and nude underwear was always sort of a creamy color. Well, in the past, there haven't been products that were made for all colors of skin. So it's kind of just ingraining it, as you said, in everything that we do, it's not only in the actual posts or marketing, but it's like just the thought processes, the product development, being a part of our team, everything. Yeah, like the beauty industry has, or the like the beauty and fashion industry has never really been inclusive when we think of like body types, right? So I know that I can only shop in certain stores. My family's from South America. My hips, I got hips for days, okay? (laughs) I'm proud of my hips for days, but I can only shop in certain stores. I know that I cannot go into a specific store that is for very thin bodies, right? But when we think about um, products, I think about not only, I think about Band-Aids, I think about underwear and lingerie, like you said. I think about how nude lipstick is marketed. Nude lipstick is not for me, right? I will look like I'm dead because it just does not, it, it, nude, nude on me doesn't look good. It just, it hasn't been marketed for me. Right. So it's just, especially, right? Because when we think of North American society for the longest time, um, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes and being white has always been put on a pedestal, mm. right? So that's kind of where a lot of products are geared towards. I find that more so in the States than it is in Canada. I find that we do have the genuine interest and we are open to making changes and doing better okay. here, which I love to see. That's awesome. I love to see that. And there's so many people who are uh, being innovative. But I think what's different about Canadians as well is that we listen. We listen right? Mm -hmm. We do listen. I think we do. Yeah. We really, we're empathetic, I think. And we, we always want to understand different cultures and because we're such a melting pot and we're so welcoming typically of, of different communities. No, you're shaking your head. (laughs) So no, no, no. no, I see that's, that's great perspective because to me, I think, Oh, Canada is such a welcoming place. It could never happen here. Welcoming in what sense though? Because when we think of like systemic racism, Mm. it happens the medical system it's happened to me in the medical system it's happened in the education system those are things that are systemic so canada as a whole on the surface and their marketing oh canada day everything's all great and we're you know we, we accept people from around the world and a lot of people don't didn't celebrate canada day this year because of its roots with colonialism oh wow right interesting right? yeah we colonized canada right we like we are not Canadian. The the land was owned by Indigenous people, yeah, and oh. I've always felt uncomfortable celebrating Canada Day. I will tell you because my family is from a country that was colonized by the British. So wow. I understand the implications of that. Wow. Okay, that's so interesting. That perspective. What What are some things that brands should avoid doing? We've talked about things that they should do, but what are some things that they can avoid doing? Gaslighting, I think, is number one, right? So part of this new movement is encouraging everybody to not necessarily call out brands, but call in brands, right? To get them to listen and to get them to shift. So for example, if you were talking about a lingerie company and you wanted to approach them and that lingerie company was then like, no, 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 you're wrong, I'm right. I think, you know, that is part of it. Like that's just one part of it. When we think about the inclusive marketing part of it, what you are doing when nobody's watching is actually more important. I will definitely say that. So making sure that you're listening as a brand, making sure that you're taking time to either invest or to learn um, what you can do better. And then you will see like everything you do inside your business will manifest on the outside and be open to making mistakes and be open to apologizing if you have to. I actually apologized recently. I was, you know, I've been on this tangent of inclusive marketing and then I got called out on my social media for not putting subtitles on one of my stories. And this was from a new follower who was hard of hearing. So I wasn't being inclusive, right? So she was being excluded. So really expanding that it's not just about race, right? Like we said, like we said earlier, people with different um, abilities, people who have different sexual orientations, think about them too. People, you know, somebody who is hard of hearing or can't hear relies on, you know, the, the, the text 
across your story to even follow it. There's that whole community. They don't get to see and you there. They don't have closed captioning on Instagram stories. Huh. So I think as brands, even myself, as you know, as I'm learning, just what can you do better? Be open to learning, be open to making mistakes, be open to improving on the inside. And then it's going to manifest on the outside. That's so good. I love that. That's beautiful. I think that we are going to end it with that beautiful mention. And I would love to ask for your recommendation on how people can get educated on this issue. What are some of the resources? Now, I know you have your webinar, so I'd love for you to speak about that. Um, And I know there's just a ton of resources out there. What are your like go-to resources that you go to? (laughs) My go-to resource is my lived experience. I will tell you that, right? So I have my lived experience. And of course I have, you know, the studies that I've done, but in terms of go-to resources, I started following people on social media that I haven't before. So making sure that you're not just following people because they're trendy, but doing a little bit of research to see whose um, perspective you can relate to follow people outside of your, outside of your norm, outside of your normal avatar and pick a couple that you want to engage with that you will, you know, ask questions to. I think we're in a time where we have this ability to have connection, one-on-one connection with people, right? So have other people be your go-to resource. There's not going to be one document or one book. Um, you know, one of the books that I've been hearing a lot about, and you could find this on like any of the book lists is White Fragility. Right. I haven't read it personally, but I've heard a lot of recommendations for it. And um, again, just be open and, and, you know, looking for different places to learn and not being afraid to ask questions, you're going to start building up the resources and building up your tools to, to be more inclusive. Yeah. And there's a ton of resources that people have mentioned. I I did love your webinar. So I'd love for you to speak about that because I thought that was a great starting point. If you're thinking about looking at inclusive marketing, what are their things to do and not do? So if you could speak about that for a bit and where they can find it. Yeah. So my inclusive marketing website, I webinar, I, I launched spontaneously. Uh, again, it wasn't one of those things that I would say I spent, you know, all this stuff has been in my head. I just haven't been able to talk about it. But what I did is well, I created seven touch points in our businesses where we can be more inclusive. And I think the thing that's really amazing is that once you see some of those examples, it really makes you reflect on your own business and how you can do things differently. So I go through the seven touch points. There is a guide in there with some resources. So again, if you're looking for stock photos and you want to be more inclusive, here are some of the websites that are paid and some of them are free. Yeah. So the resource is there. It's at she'snewsworthy.com forward slash inclusive marketing. Perfect. Awesome. And where can people find you? I am at, uh, at she's newsworthy on Instagram. I do respond to all of my DMS. And if you do DM me a question, 99% of the time, I will respond with a voice note. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> I know that very well. <laughs> I've reached out to you many times. Yeah, awesome. right. Great. Thank you so much for being on the show. I've learned so much in our little conversation and from your webinar. And I just thank you for showing up for everyone being such a leader in the space. I know you're so passionate about this, this topic and it really shows and shines and uh, just thank you for being there for everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Oh, thank you. Thank you for listening to the productpreneur podcast. If you love this episode, we'd be so grateful if you could take a sec to subscribe, share it and review it on Apple podcasts. Your review will help more women build their own dream product business. By the way, if you have any feedback, comments, or questions, email me at info at Until next time, keep dreaming up those product ideas. <laughs>